Psalm 34, the paragraph beginning with verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. Young lions lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. We'll quit there. This is contains some very good truth. Notice immediately the exhortation, taste and see that the Lord is good. One notable thing about God, he's, there is no being more transparent than God. And God invites, in fact, I think we could say, he commands investigation and testing of his truth. Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees for his doctrine. They were picking at him. He said, if you want to know whether my doctrine is the truth, do the will of God. Try it out. Put it to the test. Now, this isn't the kind of testing that is skeptical and uh, just plain disrespectful to God. The Israelites did that in the Old Testament. Well, he gave us bread. Can he give us meat? And God said, all right, I'll give you meat. And he gave them quail. And then it says he struck them dead while they were chewing it. So it's because of their um, attitude, the right attitude, he wants us, try me. See if indeed my promises won't be fulfilled. Another deep doctrine that is hinted at here is the whole idea of Christian experience. We can't know God, truly know God, without Christian experience, which is a direct supernatural intersection with God. There has to be, well, Tozer put it this way, at some point, the Spirit of God must cross the threshold of my personality and enter my heart. It is supernatural. I can know facts about God, and I must know a few, because I can't really have faith unless I know something. I can't have faith for anything without knowing at least something. But that leads, then, to experience. Experience verifies the faith, however small it was, and the knowledge that we have with which we approach God. Taste and see God's truth is verified by real life personal experience. I can't say I know God until I've had that personal experience, which is ongoing. It's repeated, it's reinforced a thousand times in our lives where God's truth and his presence and his approval of us and the witness of the Spirit is made personally clear to us. It is also, notice the very next verse, fear the Lord you his saints. It seems implied that verse 8 are, is a, an appeal to those who really don't know God. But the next verse, you saints, those who know God, are veteran believers, follow God. Those of you who fear the Lord, keep fearing him, keep walking with him. Now that introduces another thought, that in this business of experience, there's a curb around private and personal experience, and that is corporate experience. You saints together of the Lord, keep fearing him. The, a word that is used here is the word normative, meaning that the experiences we may have with the Lord individually must conform, largely at least, with customary repetitive experiences 
of other Christians recorded in Scripture. This is a barrier against fanaticism, individualism, and, and it also gives us the task, really, of rightly checking one another on what experiences we have. There are many experiences people claim they have. Well, you know, God gave me new truth. God doesn't give anybody new truth in the sense of something that's no longer, that's not written in Scripture. He doesn't reveal new truth in the sense beyond Scripture. So an experience like that is not valid. But experience properly understood, taste and see for myself, the Lord is good. This is how I know God and it verifies my knowledge. Father in heaven, teach us the proper attitude toward you in testing you and testing your truth, experimenting to and see if indeed you're telling us the truth and it verifies what faith we have that indeed you are telling the truth. Your truth is solid and it is provable, it is experienceable. So may we taste and see it's good and then continue to live by it. In Jesus' name, amen.